the pilots of an Alaska Airlines MD-80 fight desperately for control as their aircraft careens towards the Pacific Ocean with terrifying speed. No matter what they do, they cannot seem to pull their plane out of its dive. Passengers scream and loose objects are thrown to the ceiling by the G-forces. Will the pilots recover from this fall and make it to Los Angeles, just a few miles away? Or will they lose their fight against their deranged aircraft? This is the story of Alaska Airlines Flight 261. On the afternoon of January 31st, 2000, 83 passengers and five crew stepped on board a McDonnell Douglas MD-83 at Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. Most of the passengers were holidaymakers, returning home to the cold and rainy northwestern United States after a trip to sunny Mexico. The flight was bound for Seattle, but a number of passengers would disembark during a stopover at San Francisco. The flight time to San Francisco was four hours. In the cockpit on this day were two highly experienced pilots. Captain Ted Thompson was 53 years old and had built up over 17,000 hours of flying time, more than 4,000 of which were on MD-80 aircraft. He had started his flying career with the US Air Force, and by this point, he'd been flying with Alaska Airlines for 18 years. Sitting to his right was 57-year-old First Officer William Tansky. Tansky had spent 20 years flying transport aircraft for the US Navy before joining Alaska Airlines in 1985, where he accumulated over 8,000 hours flying the MD-80. Both pilots had spotless flying records. But as they set up their aircraft for departure, they had no idea that it contained a critical weakness. As it would turn out, flying this particular aircraft, along with many of the other MD-80s in Alaska Airlines fleet, was like playing Russian roulette. Cost-cutting measures at the airline had meant that it was only a matter of time before something went seriously wrong on board one of their aircraft. On this January day in the year 2000, the first signs of one such problem would appear just minutes after takeoff. At about half past three that afternoon, Flight 261 pushed back from the gate at Puerto Vallarta. The pilots started their engines and began taxiing out to the runway. The weather was perfect for flying, light winds and clear skies. At least at this point, there was no reason to suspect that the flight would be anything but routine. After a short taxi, First Officer Tansky lined the aircraft up on the runway and pushed the engines to take off power. The aircraft performed as normal on takeoff. Passengers sitting in the window seats retreated to pristine views of the sandy Mexican shorelines as the plane climbed out. First Officer Tansky flew the aircraft by hand during the departure, while Captain Thompson dealt with air traffic control. After a few minutes, as the plane passed through 6,000 feet, Tansky engaged the autopilot. My YouTube analytics page tells me that people from all over the world will be watching this video, which is pretty amazing. But unfortunately, much of the web is not as free as YouTube in terms of what you can watch. If you want to watch Friends on Netflix, for example, there are plenty of countries where you can't do this. That's where today's sponsor, Atlas VPN, comes in. Atlas VPN allows you to unlock your favorite movies and TV shows from all around the world by bypassing national restrictions. I like to use Atlas VPN when I'm buying things online because companies can't artificially increase the price based on my location or on whether I've searched for that product before. So whether I'm booking flights or hotels or just buying stuff online, I know I'm getting the best price. It's so useful at doing this because it's more than just a VPN. It blocks ads and trackers and it keeps your searches private. It even notifies you when someone tries to steal your data. You don't even need a different subscription for your phone, tablet and your PC. All of your devices are protected with a single subscription. Atlas VPN is currently running the best VPN deal on the market, giving you all of their fantastic features for just $1.70 per month and six months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. Click my link in the video description to snatch up this deal. And now back to the video. It wasn't long before the pilots encountered the first sign of trouble. As they climbed through 23,400 feet, a warning light appeared in the cockpit. It told the pilots that the autopilot was unable to move the stabilizer, the horizontal part of the tailplane. Normally as pilots or autopilots fly, they tilt the stabilizer up or down to make it easier to control the plane. For example, when they want to climb, they first pull back in the control column, which moves the elevators, these tabs at the back of the stabilizer. The upward deflection of the elevators pushes the tail of the plane down, which pushes the nose of the plane up, causing it to climb. 
but it would be too much work for the pilots to continuously pull back on the control column to keep the plane in a climb. So, they used switches on the control columns, known in the MD-80 as pickle switches, to tilt the horizontal stabilizer itself. That's the actual wing here on the tail of the plane. With the horizontal stabilizer in its new position, it does the job that the elevator had been doing previously. So there's no longer a need for the pilots, or the autopilot, to pull back on the control column to move the elevator. The purpose of this process, known as trimming, is to lower the workload for the pilots and to keep the plane in trim, making it more aerodynamic. The position of the stabilizer is shown by this indicator here in the cockpit. Forward means the trim is moving to a nose down position and backwards means it is moving towards a nose up position. For those not familiar with aviation, this is a lot of new words and new concepts, but they're vital for understanding what is now about to happen, flight 261. The warning light which had appeared in the cockpit told the pilots that the autopilot was no longer able to move the stabilizer. There were two possibilities here. Either the motors which moved the stabilizer had stopped working, or the stabilizer itself had jammed. The pilots would try to find out which one of these it was in a moment. But first, Tansky decided to disconnect the autopilot to get a feel for how the plane was flying. When he did this, he could immediately feel a problem through his control column. The aircraft was badly out of trim. With the horizontal stabilizer stuck in position, Tansky had to pull on his control column with as much as 50 pounds or 23 kilograms of force just to keep the plane climbing. There was no way the pilots could do this for the entire four hour flight. They had to get the stabilizer moving again. They took out their checklists and began troubleshooting. In the back of the aircraft, the passengers had no idea that the pilots were hard at work in the truest sense, pulling with considerable force on their controls while they tried to fix the problem with the plane. As Tansky pulled in his control column, the air was pushing against his stabilizer at a speed of 600 km per hour, over 370 miles per hour, forcing the nose of the plane down. It was not an easy task to keep the plane climbing. The checklist procedures focused on getting the pilots to try different ways of moving the stabilizer. They had tried the pickle switches, which moved electrical motors in the tailplane, but this hadn't worked. They also tried the longitudinal trim handles here, known as the suitcase handles, they had even tried both at the same time. But still, the stabilizer wouldn't budge. They tried the alternate trim system, which uses a different motor, but that too couldn't move the stabilizer. They checked the circuit breakers to see if an electrical problem had prevented the operation of the stabilizer, but all of the circuit breakers were in their normal position. No matter what the pilots did, the stabilizer was stuck at 0.4 degrees nose down. The pilots continued flying north towards San Francisco, oblivious to the danger now lurking in the tail. Inside the tail, the jack screw, which was supposed to be able to turn freely, pitching the horizontal stabilizer up and down, had become jammed. And it was even worse than that. Over repeated cycles during previous flights, the threads on the nut, which the jack screw rotated within, had begun to wear down. Incredibly, they were just now one tenth of their original thickness. They were barely hanging on. Some of the threads had already been sheared off and were tangled in the space between the jack screw and the nut. It was only a matter of time before the rest of the threads followed them. If the crew had known how serious their issue was, they would have flown back to Puerto Vallarta immediately. If they had done this, a ground crew would have inspected the plane on arrival and found that the aircraft had come terrifyingly close to catastrophe. Inside the tail of the plane was a ticking time bomb. But at this point, the pilots assumed that this was nothing more than an issue with the electrical motor which operated the stabilizer. Their checklist never mentioned that if they couldn't resolve the issue, they should land at the nearest suitable airport. As far as they were concerned, their problem was a nuisance, which meant that they couldn't use the autopilot, meaning that they would have to hand fly all the way to San Francisco, pulling back on their control columns with force all the way there. But as the crew reached their cruising altitude of 31,000 feet, there was some relief. As the aircraft began to speed up, the pressure required to keep the plane level gradually decreased. The pilots went from needing to use about 50 pounds of pulling force on the control column to just about 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms. It wasn't nothing, but it was sustainable, at least until they got to San Fran. Nonetheless, the pilots continued their attempts to fix the problem, trying the primary and secondary trim motors in different orders, and then together, 
and in every permutation they could think of. They had no idea that everything they did was only making the problem worse. Quietly, in the back of the plane, the jackscrew and its nut were like two of the Earth's tectonic plates, pressing against each other with tremendous force. In a matter of time, one of them would suddenly give. This would not be the earthquake that residents of San Francisco had come to expect. Two hours later, Flight 261 was nearing its destination, and there was still no sign of the stabilizer coming unstuck. By this point, the pilots were in touch with Alaska Airlines maintenance base in Seattle, trying to see if the engineers there could think of anything that the pilots themselves hadn't thought of. But they couldn't. The pilots had tried everything. Planes experience small maintenance issues all the time. Glitches with onboard computers, minor cockpit systems inoperative, issues in the passenger cabin, but problems with the flight controls are serious. With the plane clearly exhibiting serious flight control problems, the pilots were beginning to think that the safest thing to do would be to land at the nearest major airport. And that was LAX, just a few minutes away. As well as being the closer of the two airports, the weather there was more favorable, with the wind being straight down the runway. When the pilots raised this possibility with the maintenance engineer, and then after with the airline's dispatcher, far from helping the pilots, they pressured them to continue the flight to San Francisco. The dispatcher said that if they landed at LAX, they would disrupt the flow of aircraft at the airline, leaving some passengers late. As it would turn out, this very pressure that the airline put on the captain to continue the flight to its original destination was a result of the same commercial pressure that had caused the issue with the aircraft's tail to begin with. But that's something we'll return to in a moment. The captain told the dispatcher that he would be landing wherever it was safest. He was not about to jeopardize the lives of his passengers so that the airline could keep its schedule intact. And that meant flying to Los Angeles. At this point, the pilots had their hands full. They were preparing for a switch in their destination, and they were still trying to free up their stabilizer. They were talking to air traffic control at Los Angeles, and to the airline's dispatch center in Seattle, and to its maintenance department at Los Angeles. They were eager to free up the stabilizer for the approach and landing, the phases of flight when it is most important to have full control over the aircraft. The pilots noticed that when they used the primary trim motor, which uses the most electricity, they could see a corresponding spike in the plane's electrical usage on their instruments. This suggested that the motor was working, and therefore that the stabilizer itself was jammed. At this point, the captain decided that he would once again try the pickle switches and the suitcase handles at the same time. He wondered if perhaps just using more power would free up the jam. Unfortunately, he was right. As soon as he did this, the threads holding the jack screw in place finally gave way under the pressure. The jack screw suddenly shifted from its jammed position of 0.4 degrees nose down to beyond its maximum nose down position. The mechanical stop at the end of the jack screw slammed into the nut. This was the only thing preventing the stabilizer from going even further. Now, with the horizontal stabilizer well beyond its normal full down position, the plane lurched towards the ocean. The pilots yanked back on their control columns, desperately trying to bring the nose up. Filling their windscreens was the terrifying sight of the blue Pacific Ocean. The aircraft continued to accelerate as it powered towards the ocean, descending at a horrifying rate of over 6,000 feet per minute. As the plane got faster, it began to shake. The captain identified this, incorrectly, as the stall buffet, and told the first officer who was flying the aircraft that he had stalled. He urged the first officer to release his back pressure on the control column, as doing so would break the stall. But the plane wasn't stalling. This situation was so out of the bounds of the pilot's normal experience that they were confused about what was happening. Then, the overspeed warning began to sound, telling the pilots that they were now going so fast that they risked structurally damaging their aircraft. In response to this, they extended the speed brakes. This helped somewhat, but the rapid descent continued. They passed through 28,000 feet, then 27,000, then 26,000. The captain called air traffic control. Center Alaska 261, we are in a dive here. Alaska 261, say again, sir. Yeah, we're at 26,000 feet. We are in a vertical dive. Not a dive yet, but uh, we've lost vertical control of our airplane. Gradually, by pulling with 150 pounds of force, or about 70 kilograms, 
the pilots managed to ease the plane out of its rapid descent. But they were now in much worse shape than they were just a few moments ago. With the horizontal stabilizer now stuck in a new position beyond its normal limits, the pilots had to pull with tremendous force just to keep the plane flying level, and there was no telling whether it could get even worse. The controller could see on his radar that the aircraft had deviated significantly from its crew's altitude. He asked the pilots for an update. Alaska 261, clear condition. 261, we're at 24,000 feet, kind of stabilized. We're slowing here, and uh, we're going to uh, do a little troubleshooting. Can you give me a block between uh, 20 and 25? Alaska 261, maintain block altitude by level 200 through by level 250. Last 261, we'll take that block, we'll be monitoring Without being able to control the aircraft's pitch, the pilots needed a clear block of space above and below them. This way, they wouldn't crash into any other aircraft while they experimented with the aircraft's configuration. In a last ditch effort to find a solution that might save their lives, the captain handed control over to the first officer and radioed maintenance at LAX. He told them that he had tried both the suitcase handles and the pickle switches, and that the trim had moved to the full nose down position. But maintenance didn't seem to appreciate the seriousness of the issue. They told the pilots that they could try doing the same thing again if they wanted, but that in any case, they would see them at the gate shortly. 20,000 feet above the Pacific, the pilots of Flight 261 were on their own. Stuck in a corner, Thompson and Tansky began formulating a plan to prepare the aircraft for landing. They needed to see how the plane would perform as they got slower and started extending the flaps and slats. If this was going to pose a problem, they would much rather find this out now, above the ocean, than on final approach over the densely populated suburbs of LA. But before they tried anything with the aircraft, the captain decided to brief the passengers. They had been petrified by the sudden dive, and needed some assurance that the pilots had the situation under control. He got on the PA and told the passengers that they were having flight control problems, that they were working on a fix, and that they would be diverting to Los Angeles. They would touch down in the next 20 to 30 minutes. Passengers sitting on the right hand side could see the sprawling city of Los Angeles stretching out along the coast. So close, and yet so far. It would be an agonizing few minutes while they waited for the pilots to land. Showing great situational awareness and presence of mind, Thompson asked air traffic control to stay over the bay while they configured the aircraft for landing. If another dive occurred, he wanted to minimize the number of casualties by having the plane crash into the water and not into the city. First Officer Tansky then suggested a useful change to the captain's plans. He said that they should try to reconfigure the aircraft at their current altitude of about 18,000 feet, rather than at 10,000 feet, as the captain had told the controller. The air was thinner at 18,000 feet, so it wouldn't mimic the conditions close to landing as well as the air at 10,000 feet would, but more importantly, it would give them space to recover if the aircraft entered another dive. Despite the enormous pressure they were under, and the sheer physical exertion required to keep the plane level, both Thompson and Tansky were working together extremely well, systematically approaching the situation and foreseeing potential dangers. Now, slowed down, the pilots began to set the aircraft up for landing. The first officer extended the slats. The aircraft remained controllable, but it still wasn't easy. A few moments later, the captain told him to extend the flaps as well. This configuration was close to what the plane would be at closer to landing. And it was stable. The least risky option at this point was to bring the plane in for landing. Given that they now knew that the plane was controllable in this configuration, doing this made the most sense. But rather than doing that, the captain wanted to try one more time to free the stabilizer. He knew that in its current position, the force of the air was hitting its lower surface, keeping it stuck in place. If he could bring the nose of the aircraft up and then let it fall down, the air would briefly hit the stabilizer head on and it would no longer be pushed up by the force of the air. From that position, he would use the trim switches and try to move the stabilizer back to its normal position while there was no pressure on it. If his plan worked, it would fix all of their problems. Thompson called a flight attendant into the cockpit and told her to prepare the cabin the passengers would need to be strapped in for this manoeuvre. He told the first officer to retract the flaps and the slats. But the captain didn't realise quite how bad the problem in the tail was. 
he had no idea that the threads on the nut were already sheared off. Even if the stabilizer did move, there would be nothing there to catch it. The first officer objected to his plan, saying that they shouldn't risk it. So far, everything they had done had only made their problems worse. With the plane already controllable the way it was, the wise thing to do was to stop experimenting further and to just bring it to the airport. After some thought, the captain agreed. Thompson told the first officer to extend the flaps. It was time to go to LAX. But just as Tansky did this, an enormous bang came from the back of the plane. Under incredible aerodynamic pressure, the stabilizer had popped its tip fairing brackets clean off and had swung straight up. This pushed the aircraft straight down into a terrifying plunge. The pilots had now completely lost control of the vertical pitch of their aircraft. Any chance that they would be able to free the stabilizer had now disappeared. But that didn't stop them from trying. With the aircraft pitching to over 70 degrees nose down, almost vertical, the captain reasoned that if the plane wanted to pitch down, he would let it, but he would put it upside down, so that down was up. He flipped the aircraft onto its back. Incredibly, his plan worked. The aircraft's nose was beginning to rise. What started off as a 70 degree pitch down gradually became just 10 degrees. Flight 261 was now flying inverted. The pilots were hanging on by their shoulder straps and Captain Thompson was straining to push his control column forwards to bring the nose up. The first officer retracted the flaps and slats to see if this would allow them to control the plane any better. Captain Thompson urged Tansky to push with him and both pilots desperately tried to heave the plane's nose above the horizon. But passenger jets cannot fly upside down. All the pilots had managed to do was to slow the plane's descent. If they were to have any chance, they would need to flip the plane back. The captain shouted at the first officer to help him kick the left rudder to swing the plane right side up. But upside down, Tansky couldn't reach it. So they switched to the right rudder, pushing it as much as they could. But it was no good. There simply wasn't enough time. The engines began to sputter and stall, unable to deal with the extreme angle of the oncoming air. The first officer extended the speed brakes in an effort to slow the plane down. But with the water fast approaching, both pilots knew that there was no saving the plane now. Captain Thompson said, here we go. At 20 minutes past four that afternoon, flight 261 slammed into the ocean. There were no survivors. And he just hit the water. Uh, yes, sir. He, uh, yeah, he hit the water, he's uh, down. Okay. The most galling thing about the crash of Flight 261 is how utterly preventable it was. Pure corporate greed on the part of Alaska Airlines had caused them to schedule less frequent maintenance inspections of the jack screw assembly in the tail of the plane. Poor adherence to procedures, which was endemic in the company's maintenance department, also meant that the full procedure for greasing the jack screw was often not followed. On Alaska 261, this ultimately culminated in a jack screw which was essentially dry as it creaked up and down during flight. It was only a matter of time before it simply broke, as it did on January 31st, 2000. Two years before the crash, a mechanic at the airline had raised concerns about the airline's shoddy maintenance practices, which included faking maintenance records with the Federal Aviation Administration. As a result of this, Alaska Airlines had put him on paid leave. This was an airline with no regard for the safety of its workers or its customers. Much has changed as a result of the crash of Flight 261. For one thing, modern aircraft, the 737 MAX excluded, are designed such that no single failure point, like a poorly maintained jack screw, can cause a crash. Checklists were also modified to discourage pilots from repeatedly trying items which do not work, and they also now tell pilots to divert if they have significant flight control problems. But most of the safety recommendations in the final report were aimed at Alaska Airlines and the FAA, stressing the need to shorten maintenance intervals for critical components like those found in the tail of the aircraft. For their heroic efforts to save the plane and its 86 passengers and crew, Thompson and Tansky were both posthumously awarded the Airline Pilots Association Gold Medal for heroism. Their decision to keep the plane over the water saved the lives of many people on the ground, preventing this from becoming a much worse disaster than it already was.